The elders made me an apostate. And ultimately, that's the truth. But before we get to that point, I'm going to rewind a little bit and see if I can give you a clear outline of the things that happened to me that essentially woke me up. My wake up process was quite a lengthy one. And if I think back now, it probably started very early on in my childhood and culminated with my husband waking up and the way the congregation had responded to that process for him. I was born in Cape Town, South Africa, and I then relocated with my family to a very small congregation in Donegal, Ireland. And that is where I would say I had the bulk of my indoctrination. As a teenager, I witnessed the ruining of reputations um, rather scathingly within that congregation. I witnessed fights, uh, sometimes physical fights or backhanded comments as well within that congregation. And that is also the congregation where my family ended up uh, splitting apart, my parents separated in that congregation. So a lot of things happened during my teenage years that would have initially started to set off alarm bells. But it wasn't really until I firstly started pioneering that the wake up process really began. There were things I noticed when I started out pioneering that made me very uncomfortable. Firstly, it wasn't something that I ever set out to do. I pioneered because at the time I could not find suitable work and my hand was forced by the elders in the congregation. They said I had no excuse and so the only option for me was to pioneer. And being the people pleaser I was, that's what I did. I did find work, which of course they said was Jehovah's blessing, which it was not. It was a lot of hard work to eventually find a job. And I continued to pioneer. I think I only made it two years of pioneering, really. And that was then before my daughter was born. And at that point, I'd stepped down. But while pioneering, there were things I'd noticed, such as the way other pioneers weren't positive. There was a lot of talk, um, and I know mental health is a sensitive subject, but there was a lot of talk over poor mental health um, being a pioneer. Many of the pioneers were on medication to help them cope, or almost all of them, really, that I knew of some form of medication for anxiety. And I felt a lot of pressure once I had become a pioneer that made me understand why those others had got to the point of needing medication. There are a lot of expectations put on pioneers, um, a lot that I guess people don't really talk about, and maybe that's worth another video. But also something I noticed was with regard to the lack of positivity in the environment was coffee breaks, tea breaks were spent snooping on people who had been disfellowshipped or people who were inactive looking at their Facebook profiles or gossiping about people who appeared weaker in the congregation. And me being a very private person, that made me feel terribly uncomfortable. I never said anything to anyone because of course I don't like to ruffle feathers or I didn't at the time. And over time, it wore me down a little bit. And I was actually very grateful that when my daughter was born, I had an excuse to stop pioneering. Although I had every intention of trying to continue, realistically, it wasn't going to happen. Another chink in the armor or the cracking of the armor was when my daughter herself was born. And that's a big life change, a really big life change that in our particular congregation, not many people understood. It was a predominant, predominantly older congregation, 
filled with pioneers, regular pioneers, special pioneers. I think at one point, 50% of that congregation was pioneers. So very few people who had understanding of what it was like to have children. And there were a lot of, again, expectations put on us as a young couple with a child to keep her quiet to silence her. She wasn't allowed to make a sound. She wasn't allowed to get up from her seat. There were um, talks on the platform about it. And it just got progressively worse as we then went on to have a second child and maybe a couple more families moved into the hall. And so the noise level naturally went up. Children cannot sit for two hours silently. It is impossible to expect this of them. At one point, an elder physically took my daughter, put her in her pram and pushed me out the Kingdom Hall door and said, don't come back until she's a she was asleep. At that point in time, I was pregnant with my second, which I had a high risk pregnancy and I was technically supposed to be on bed rest. So I was breaking my bed rest rules to make sure that I went to the Kingdom Hall and here I was being pushed out onto the street to push her around when really I shouldn't have even been on my feet in the first place. With no regard for my well-being, her well-being, nothing. And it was something that had worn me down over a period of time, something I couldn't stop thinking about as it progressively got worse and there were more local needs on children needing to behave. Um, it really got on my nerves. It really, really did. That was a major thing for me. But something that I'm very grateful for was my daughter's free thinking from a very young age. At only, I think between about 14, 14 to 16 months old, she was able to point out to me in my book of Bible stories, the picture um, on the account of the flood where the mother and baby were sitting on the rock. And she said to me, mommy, are they going to die? And I was absolutely shocked to my core. I realized I couldn't give her an answer. I didn't want to give her an answer. It was how do you explain death to such a young child, a one-year-old? It's a very difficult subject. And so that was it. That was the last time I read my book of Bible stories to her. I closed the book and I put it on the shelf. And at this point I did not tell Patrick about any of that. I didn't tell him about the things that were upsetting me in the congregation because by the time our second was on her way, Patrick had been made an elder. And prior to him even being made an elder, I could see that things were changing with him. I wasn't sure if it was something I was doing or if he was facing pressures at work. It was not something that we spoke about, it seemed like a very sensitive subject. But once we got to a certain point where something upsetting had happened in the congregation, and I said to him, I'm not sure that this is the truth. Sometimes I just wonder how can this possibly be the truth when people behave like that? That is when he confessed to me how he had been feeling and that ultimately he didn't think he could remain a witness because he did not believe in Jehovah anymore or the organization. So the things were beginning to mount. I didn't know that he'd been having these feelings and obviously that had been happening for a number of years for him. And in the midst of all of that happening, there also was an incident with our eldest in the congregation, which I know I've spoken about in um, an early video, but I thought it would be good to chat about it, um, do this video again from a slightly more healed viewpoint. We had an incident in the Kingdom Hall with my eldest and another child um, having inappropriate behavior toward her. I'm not going to go into detail on this point, but it is, it's a very sensitive subject and 
it had set off a lot of emotional trauma that I thought I'd put behind me because I had had similar ongoing abuse experience with an older child in my childhood from around the age of five to the age of 10. And witnessing, because I was the only one who witnessed what happened with my daughter, really triggered a lot of things in me, a lot of suppressed trauma layered on top of the fact that abuse within the organization was not something that I was unfamiliar with on another level in our family. Let's just say there has been a history um, in one side of my family of child abuse. So things were really beginning to break apart and I was terrified, absolutely terrified. I'd eventually spoken to a close friend about um, some, the thing that had happened, the um, incident with our eldest daughter, and she was the only one that I had opened up to about it, because there were so many things that were unspoken, and many of you know in the organisation, that they keep us quiet, they shut you up, they literally, they tape your mouths shut and you are trapped. It, it really does feel like entrapment. You can't f openly talk about things without being seen as weak or without believing that you are gonna be punished. And I know this is a very sensitive subject and one that maybe would be better off in its own video entirely but just to touch on it. So that was something that really did, that was beyond crack really, that, that broke me and made me emotionally able to hear and understand what Patrick was going to, going, going through. And although it took some time, it took me a solid two years from Patrick telling me that he was awake to myself being awake to the point of leaving before things really came to a head. In that time frame, I was also faced with the fact, again, as previously mentioned in another video, that I couldn't leave my mum and that was a really big thing for me and probably why my waking process was slowed down somewhat because I fought it and I fought it really hard. <laughs> but eventually it became exhausting and I just couldn't keep up the charade any longer. Going to meetings eventually on my own with the children on my own and then starting to fade the children out of going to the Kingdom Hall because we, at that point, had, I'd agreed with Patrick that the girls would stay home with him and that I'd come to the realization that I couldn't raise them as Jehovah's Witnesses and I didn't want to raise them as Jehovah's Witnesses, but that I would continue to hold on for the sake of my mum. Things from that point sped up quite a bit because Patrick and I are a very, very close couple and I found it very upsetting to deal with the way it got to the point that he was almost ignored in conversation I would have with other people inside the congregation. They just pretended he didn't exist, like it was, it was easier for them to pretend that he was dead. He never came up in conversation. The only person invited places with other Jehovah's Witnesses would be me. And he would just be excluded altogether or, you know, would be me and possibly the kids. And to me, it just didn't feel right because it was either take all of us or none of us. And that's something I don't think they could understand. Many people had spread rumors. 
I had more than one person come up to me on occasion and say that they're sorry that Patrick has cheated on me. So obviously the gossip mill was well and truly underway. Other people saying they thought that depression had skipped him and the family as there is a history with Patrick's family anyway and saying, oh, how disappointing it is to see him go from such a good man to being what he is now. And also someone very close to us who said that if he doesn't start going back to the meetings, he might still be good now, but that's not gonna last. He's gonna be bad. I simply couldn't cope with hearing such negativity about someone I love so much and things that I knew were not true. So again, that contributed to my waking up process. But to get around to the elders and how the elders ultimately turned me into an apostate was one evening in February 2019. And if you remember correctly from other videos, that was the month that we finally disassociated. Two elders, two very new elders in the congregation showed up at my front door on a Friday evening uh, when my sister-in-law had only just shown up herself about half an hour prior to them. Patty was out for the evening playing a game of Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> not that they knew that and not that I admitted to that but they came in to my house unannounced, um, which is something that I'd asked them not to do. And they sat down on the sofa and basically said to me that it has come, in exactly their words, it has come to their attention that I had made an accusation an accusation of a serious nature that involved the congregation. And I was absolutely floored. I thought, what on earth, what on earth have I done? Surely I hadn't done anything wrong. I hadn't spoken to anyone. I was keeping myself to myself at this point and altogether was finding it very hard to attend any meetings at all. Turns out that the friend I had confided in about the incident with our daughter had then gone and not out of any malice at all, had gone to her elders in a different congregation and had asked them what measures did they have in place for protecting children in their congregation? Because if something like this could happen and it happened in the main auditorium in front of the congregation. No one else saw it except me by chance. But if something like that can happen in a kingdom hall and to someone she knows, she wanted to know how her elders were implementing safety measures for their congregation. But as we know, that is not the way it was taken. Instead, that elder went to my body of elders and made it out that I had made an accusation of a child, which I had not and which I would never do, having been a child in that position before myself growing up, having been an abuse victim. And truly, I did not know what to say to them. I, I sat there probably a good few minutes before eventually coming out with the fact that I didn't appreciate them saying to me that I accused anyone because I wouldn't and I couldn't. It's just not in me to behave like that towards a child. And of course they started changing their tune pretty quickly, started backtracking, saying they shouldn't have used that language and all of a sudden change the subject. No, how are you? No, how is your child? No question of how can we support you? We're 
which is what the normal human thing, the normal human response would have been. My mind was blown. Instead, they asked me, would I then, since Paddy wasn't home, like to divulge any information on my husband? To which shocked me a second time because of even the language that they used to divulge information. It almost sounded like I was being interrogated, you know, like I was on the stand, standing trial for something. And I said, no. I then proceeded to change it back to the question of um, child protective measures. And I started drilling them with questions. Thank you very much to Reddit for those questions and the community on there with questions are of what kind of things they had implemented in the congregation to safeguard children and trying to make them think about the fact that the things they'd implemented weren't actually any implementation at all of safety measures and that it was just a whole lot of fluff, if you will, a whole lot of talking and no action. And at that point, I think they must have realized that I, ha I was armed with more information than they were prepared for. And the elder tried to catch me out. He tried to catch me out on the on a website. He the way he worded it was, "What information had I been re had I been reading on websites?" But when I said to him, I don't understand what he's asking because I was referring to the, the policy on jw.org, shall we say. And so he very quickly went, oh, oh, right, okay, okay. And then brought up the policy, which was on the website, which I already knew. And at that point, things got quite uncomfortable that particular elder then started crying about his own um, history of abuse within the family. And I can't tell you how uncomfortable the whole situation was. I mean, it was an hour and a half of absolute mental and emotional torture. I didn't know what to do with a full grown man crying on my couch that I didn't know. I really didn't know him. I hadn't been attending meetings as regularly. And he brought a second elder who was very young in his early twenties with him, who simply sat and got deeper and deeper into my sofa because he also didn't know what to say. He didn't know what to do. He was probably the most uncomfortable person in the room. And at that point, through the conversation, with them, I knew that, that that was it. Those two elders, truly, I should thank them because it was at that point that the, the switch just it flipped. I knew I couldn't do it any longer. I knew that I would take my sister-in-law to the meeting on Sunday I would leave my kids behind. I would hug who I needed to, and that's just what I did. And that I would never set foot in there again. And ultimately, those two elders did more for me in that hour and a half of mental and emotional torture than anyone had done in the organization in my whole life because they finally helped me make up my mind to take the steps to freedom that I needed for my family. And that is the point at which I said to Patrick, can we please disassociate? I am done. By that Sunday evening, we had written our disassociation letters. On the Monday, I went and I said goodbye to my very best friend who I grew up with in the organization who is sadly still in. She was my maid of honor and someone who I miss dearly. Uh, I went and I said my goodbyes to her. 
I have to thank her if she ever sees this video for listening to me, for giving me the time of day to have a coffee and hear me out. She heard me out for over an hour. And I just hope one day what I had to say resonates with her because I would love nothing more than to hug her again. And after that, there were maybe a handful of people to send a message to, to say goodbye to. Um, two of which of my close friends have now also left, which is wonderful. And our disassociation letters went in. Valentine's Day 2019, which we now refer to as our Freedom Day. So this year, in February 2022, will mark our third anniversary of freedom from Jehovah's Witnesses. And that is a little bit of an overview of my story and my experience of waking up. Of course, there's probably many things that I have left off and forgotten about and that I will remember after this video, but I wanted to sit down with you all and say it from a different point of view. As I know I previously, in those very early videos, the early days of leaving, were so raw and so broken and held a lot of anger and a lot of pain in them. But I don't have that anger or that pain. It's not burning hot anymore. Sometimes it creeps up on me and I think that's only natural, we're all human. But for the most part, I can talk about and I can think about the process of leaving and I can think about my experience as a Jehovah's Witness with a very neutral attitude um, and it's taken a lot of time and a lot of hard work to get there. And I just hope that by telling my story and my experience that it, it gives comfort to someone out there and that maybe even my friends or my family will watch it and know that I love them still and I'm thinking of them and thinking of anyone going through the waking up process and I do genuinely appreciate all of you who have sat and listened to me waffle on <laughs> but it's very therapeutic to say it and I look forward to hearing your experiences of leaving. Please, I, I would love to hear what are the things that started breaking down your beliefs in Jehovah's Witnesses, how did your cracks appear? And thank you very much for watching.